So good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here and to present that what uh, has been done in Ethiopia since 2016. And as you see on my presentation, there is my name plus team. And what we have achieved here is not what I have achieved. I had a huge team starting from the ministry. We had then the uh, Ethiopian Research and Education Network. We then reached out to the Ethiopian universities and we had strong support from Italy, from the University of uh, Catania, Professor uh, Roberto Barbera, and we had also some support from the University of Vienna um, to bring this in action, what I want to present to you here right now. And um, the title is uh, Digital Literacy Brings Freedom of Research. Here I also bring in somehow my experience as a researcher here in, in the country. I came here in 2016, first as a uh, scientist for education, higher education, and now I'm in the Institute, Ethiopian Institute for Higher Education as uh, managing director. I walk you through this presentation. First of all, the digital literacy, the Ethiopian situation right now, what we have achieved. Reflections on freedom of research. Here I bring also in my own experience, how it is to work as a researcher here in Ethiopia. Then f uh, freedom through open access. Digital literacy brings freedom for uh, researchers and the way forward for Ethiopia, what is on, on our agenda for the next years. First of all, I think it's very important to see the situation in Ethiopia. The Ethiopians know quite well that in 2004 they had four universities. Now we have almost 50 universities. That means in 15 years time, they have created 40 universities with the complete infrastructure. Of course, there were a lot of shortcomings, and the shortcomings uh, we could take as our challenge. One of the shortcomings was the lack, on, um, lack of access to international literature, lack of access to international research, lack of access of Ethiopian researchers to international research communities, lack of researchers, scientists, and lecturers in general, and then, of course, very, very high on the agenda was plagiarism uh, of academic works. All that brought the ministry uh, on together and um, was very passionate to introduce institutional repositories for each university. And these institutional repositories should be coordinated by Ethernet, the Ethiopian Research and Education Network. Coincidentally, we had also, we, that means now all Africa, we had three Horizon 2020 projects ongoing. The one I will refer right now is SciGaia. And this SciGaia project is uh, Science Gateway and E-Infrastructure Africa. And with that all started to bring the idea of maybe we let's say African Open Science Cloud to Ethiopia. In Europe at that time there were a high level expert group working on the European Open Science Cloud. Information was not really secret but it was difficult to find information about this uh, European Open Science Cloud. The SciGaia project had in mind something similar, maybe an African Open Repository and this has been presented already to the different nations, um, those um, of the regional research and education networks. We have the West and the Central, the, this is the Wakran. We have the East and the, uh, the South uh, African research and education network, the Ubuntu net, we had the North, um, and this was Arsrin. That means with this idea, they have covered already all the continent and beyond because the Middle East was included as well. And this was in 2016. At the same time, we started then discussing how we can bring 
the institutional repositories together that they can take advantage from the African repository or the African Open Science Cloud. And the idea was to come up with a national um, academic digital repository of Ethiopia, the NADRE. And uh, we started with the umbrella, more or less, because the institutional repositories was uh, with the universities. We did not interfere into that, but uh, we tried to bring the knowledge from the Saigaya to the NADRE. And, uh, but we had also the idea that the NADRE should then be um, somehow built that in case institutional repositories are not ready at that time, universities have the option to go for the in, uh, NADRE as an institutional repository. That means the NADRE has some two functions, one side the national repository, on the other side the institutional repository. Uh, this went all quite well. We had good collaborators, as mentioned, the Ethernet. We had then the Higher Education Strategy Center. I have been working with them for four years. Then we had the Ministry, first Ministry of Education, then later on the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Then we had the Consortium of Ethiopian Academic Research Libraries, Dr. Solomon, uh, who also supported uh, our uh, approach and the dissemination. And in line with that, we said now we have the infrastructure, we have everything, how we can bring now this to, to the people? Because at the end, the researchers have to use that. And we started working on uh, the digital literacy. And we started offering digital literacy for researchers. And again, luckily that we have been somehow involved in the Saigaya project, we got acquainted with um, the carbon trees. The Carpentries is a worldwide, is an organization based in, in the U.S., but is acting worldwide. It's a volunteer um, organization, and uh, we have standards for curricula. And the most common carpentry approach is the data carpentry, where we introduce the researchers from the spreadsheet to the cleaning of big data, and open refine and the coding. Um, we use R. We have then also the, the software carpentry. In the software carpentry, we have then Python, and uh, we have then also the library carpentry, what reaches out then to the librarians. And all these carpentries have in mind to bring digital literacy to researchers and to support them. And we started very small with a small group. Um, we had the trainer coming from South Africa, and uh, we started first with the ladies, because it's all them easier to start uh, with female researchers. It's easy to get them, uh, for, uh, to, to convince them to a new idea, and they are curious, and they came, and they started to work with us. And this was quite a success story, and meanwhile we have trained 1,300 plus researchers in the carpentries, that means digital literacy, uh, digital literacy reached out to all universities in Ethiopia. Of course, we are not uh, at the end right now. We still work uh, on um, the, the train the trainer activities that every university have a, a critical number of trainers to, to offer them uh, digital literacy workshops to the own scientists and researchers, and also students, because we should not forget industry also needs data, big data, needs people knowing how to code and use the big data. What is now the status in, in the um, digital literacy in Ethiopia? On one side, as mentioned, we have done the digital literacy trainings. We have then found out we need uh, periodical uh, training sessions. We came up with the idea of uh, monthly R hackathons. And these are for six hours. We provide the database. The database comes from the World Bank. Uh, all the, I think all the African countries have the same database for, the, for their countries. It's a huge database. We just pick out maybe a public health and so we take uh, five, six um, variables 
And then we provide the database in CSV to the participants and they have then six hours to code and at the end they should come up uh, with um, a problem statement and uh, a proposal for a call for proposal. Then we have also implemented Our Ladies. This is a quite a big organization worldwide, Our Ladies Global. We have Addis Abeba, we have then also uh, sister organizations and each of the sister organizations can become an independent organization and can be, get listed then also uh, in the global list of Our Ladies groups worldwide. What we are doing uh, with our ladies, this is uh, we have annual competitions. We have then uh, started with Code Your Future. This is uh, where we focus on coding for girls, that uh, they, our ladies become mentors for uh, girls, high school girls. And then what we have this year, most likely the third time, this is a, a hackathon, a NASA Space Apps Challenge hackathon worldwide. For 72 hours, we are linked with the globe, and uh, we, are, we have been in East Africa, the only country in 2018. Last year, we had a, a few more, but nevertheless, uh, I think this is something very important, and uh, of course, there's a huge potential, and many other universities could join uh, in, in that as well. And then uh, what we have started once we have uh, become more professional, once the uh, libraries have taken over, and uh, once uh, they started to populate the, the NADRA, this is then the data management plan, and I think Dr. Solomon McConnell will then also talk about the data management plan more in detail, how librarians get trained to support the researchers. On one side also in the coding as data analyst, as, uh, data scientist, and on the other side also for the IT part, for using the, the facilities. Now, the freedom for a researcher. I have to say, as a researcher, outside of Europe, I have a lot of freedom myself. At least I experience this as that. And I brought here a list what I see as um, a freedom for a researcher. First of all, the autonomy in developing and managing the research project. Independence from political and sponsor influence. Approaching sponsors with the most suitable facilities for uh, specific research. Composing a research team, what suits my research best. Choosing any research methodology, I think it's the best one. Uh, choosing research questions and hypotheses I want to see fulfilled. Having access to global data with no barriers, that means I, I contradict to, to, uh, the, this, um, the questioner, no, the, the person asking about the data uh, just before. Here in, in Africa, I have access um, to data in the same way as I have it in Europe, but w with all the facilities here, the African facility, and uh, everyone has the same here. Uh, then we have play, the possibility to play with data and thoughts with no limits. That means uh, through data carpentry, I have learned to all the coding and we can play around. We do the visualization, we, we crisscross and uh, we can come up with ideas. Never we have thought before this could be valuable for, an, uh, for a research or something like that. We can then interpret the findings as we wish. We can see into the findings. We can start uh, from scratch again with new questions based on the, the findings we see. Having the choice to publish and share uh, research outcomes. That means no one expects me that uh, I do the publication in a, uh, in a certain journal focusing on the impact factor. I can publish or I don't publish or I can bring it to a newspaper, not to a channel. Whatever I want to do, I can see it as useful for the, for the people and not for my uh, personal career. I have the freedom to decide. And then, of course, the commercialization of research fundings. I can bring, as an economist, of course, it's, it's not that, that I have a patent or can get a patent, but in case I would find a patent uh, or I can go for a license and uh, I can start my own business. This is all the freedom what I have, what I see here. But now coming to the term freedom, freedom as such is quite limited. 
this I found uh, in the research I have done for that. This is the freedom what the state can, uh, can give to the uh, citizens. These are the set of rules and regulations to provide freedom uh, for individuals. And it's very interesting what Emil Durkheim already said at, uh, in, the, in the past uh, centuries. The bigger the state, the greater the freedom. That means the, the more organized the state, the greater the freedom for people. Then as an individual, uh, freedom of an individual is set out by law of the country following the UN Declaration uh, of the Universal uh, Human Rights. It becomes now a bit more critical. What is the freedom of a scientist? Of course, first of all, I'm an individual. I have the, uh, the freedom of an individual. But then um, I'm bound already to obey uh, the law of the country, the conscious and the ethical demands of the profession. That means this limits already my personal freedom, the profession. Then bound by international laws to which their state either has or has not subscribed. Are we allowed to do business with Somalia right now? Are we allowed to do business with uh, what is another critical country, Iran. Can we do research together with Iran? Are we allowed? We have to find out. Uh, we'll have loyalties to be, uh, uh, we'll have loyalties to their country and uh, maybe bound by official secret laws. This is all, uh, as an Austrian, I know it quite well, this is all we have as long as we had the Soviet Union, the East Bloc. This was all our limitation towards the Eastern European countries. Then, the research and science, freedom in research and science. Scientific freedom is the freedom to engage in scientific inquiry, pursue and apply knowledge, and communicate openly. Scientific freedom is considered to be a as essential prerequisite for research independence and legitimacy. And this I found in an open letter what, uh, that has written um, a researcher uh, announced from uh, already in 2018, and it's published in the rdalliance.org. Uh, researching a bit more about uh, freedom in research. How much freedom does research really have? And I come up then with uh, the German example because it's quite well elaborated and it's uh, publicly accessible. And in Germany, the freedom of research is already set in the German basic law in Article 5, Paragraph 3. And uh, based on that, uh, researchers have a first anchor to see what is uh, in there. And uh, then we have uh, research constraints determined by legal provisions. And here, um, um, restriction, there are restrictions uh, of freedom of research to protect significant uh, constitutional protected values and may even prohibit uh, research objectives, regulate methods, or ban the export of knowledge, service, and products to certain countries. Then we have uh, in this German uh, approach, this uh, comes from, from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, and Leopoldina, they have together worked on, on this topic. They then focus on general recommendation of ethical, responsible research. And here, they elaborate uh, general principles for research. Risk analysts, um, minimum of risk or minimizing risk, evaluating publications, foregoing research as a last resort, uh, documentation and communication uh, of risks, training and information, and persons' responsibles or responsibilities. 
And uh, this is also somehow what we find already, if you know the Max Planck Institute, they, they already started with uh, that, uh, with ethics in research in 2010. And uh, I think this has then been published in 2012. And um, what they, can them, uh, they came them up with uh, recommendations for research institutions. And uh, we're saying uh, legal provision and compliance units should be established. Ethic rules and research ethics committees should be is established. And education and training for researchers. Now, coming back to the open access, freedom through open access, what I appreciate here so much in the country. Uh, I come here with a, a definition, free and unrestricted online access to scientific literature at no charge and with no technical barriers. The only technical barrier what we find here in the country very often is the internet. But if internet works, we have quite good access to everything, to literature available, to open repositories around the world. Um, yeah, there's no disadvantage I could say we have. Because also in Europe, we should not forget, uh, research budgets very often are not given. Or, especially from my side as an economist, they rather brought their research budget to science and not to economics. Because for economics, you don't need apparatuses, you don't need uh, uh, big uh, facilities, you have a laptop and that's it. And therefore, often not even money was available to spend for literature. But with the open access, everything is possible. What is now the objective, what we, um, advocate here in, in Ethiopia primarily. We have an, an answer to the ever-increasing journal subscriptions. Uh, as mentioned before, we have uh, very young universities and lack of access to literature. University libraries need to be built. Subscription fees are an add-on and cannot be covered. Um, and we should not forget, in Europe, they started all the open access activity because of the subscription fees. The high subs subscription fees university libraries could not cover anymore. Then we have the free access for scholars from developing countries and uh, developed countries together. That means here we are equal. If internet works, we have the same chances. And the Europeans, I have to say here, because I experienced it, they are not much better in all the um, digital literacy than we are here. That means we have to do this in Ethiopia because we have no other access to literature. In Europe, they have the old libraries. They have well-equipped libraries. They can go there. They can take books. We can't. We don't have libraries. Oh, we have libraries, but they are empty. Then we have uh, the visibility of research findings. This is the next part. Where is um, African research? It's nowhere. Why it's nowhere? Because everyone wants to publish uh, in journals with high impact factors. They have to pay for that. Where are the journals with high impact factor? Where do the Africans then uh, publish? Very often the Africans then don't publish in Africa, but they do it in the UK, they do it in Germany, and then it's not anymore an African research that is published, but it's a, a German research or it's an, a UK research. Uh, reading and uh, using research findings from around the globe. A new topic is on, on the agenda. We Google, we have it, we go for Google Scholar, it's the easiest way, or we go into the repositories where we are linked. Uh, one, with one minute. Oh, then I have to, to speed up. And many more, then I will not elaborate this uh, more in detail. Uh, digital literacy brings freedom because we know how to handle um, the access to open data, to open literature. Uh, we come then to the way forward, and the way forward, what we really need in Ethiopia and all, in all Africa, this is 
the introduction of, um, nature, of repository governance and leadership. We can set up a repository. Technically, it's easy. It's, it's done within a few days or even within hours. But then people have to use it to take advantage out of that. This needs governance, this needs leadership, and it has to be on the agenda of each researcher that uh, we have to go for digital literacy, that we can work with the big data, and that we can create our own research communities, that we can do cross-border research, that we are not anymore dependent from sponsors, that uh, we have the freedom in the research, what we want to do, because money is not anymore an issue. I close with that.